Hey, Walter Sorrell's back with the next in my series of videos about an introduction to IDPA. This one covers safety. So what could be more boring than safety, right? Well, here's the thing. First, you don't want to shoot anybody and you don't want to get shot. These are life altering, possibly life ending events. But putting that aside, IDPA's mechanism for safety enforcement is disqualification. Pack up your stuff, go home. It's nothing personal, it is what it is, but it's just really embarrassing. So don't let it happen to you. So let me make a general point about safety in the context of IDPA. If you poke around on the internet, you're going to hear guys who say, well, IDPA treats you like a kid or the rules are really inflexible about dumb little technical violations or whatever. Well, in a sense, that's exactly right. But here's why it's that way. At any given match, there is that guy. You know the guy I'm talking about, a person who lacks any sort of judgment or who maybe just doesn't have a proper foundation of instruction in firearms, firearm safety, firearms handling, whatever. In a perfect world, we would know exactly who that guy is and we could treat him with special rules. But the fact is that your safety officer, when you walk up there, he doesn't know if you're really skilled and conscientious or if you're a total moron. So. It's just common sense that IDPA rules have to be pegged to that guy. The rules are there to keep everybody safe from that guy. So be respectful of why the rules are the way they are. And you know, the thing is that once you internalize the rules, they really become second nature. You stop dwelling on them and they don't, you know, they're just not an issue anymore. So first point, guns never come out of the holster, never, ever, ever, unless a safety officer specifically tells you to take it out. All right, now you may load it, Kind of the, the desktop assault. Second point, most matches have a designated safe area uh, for gun handling. Uh, if you have to mess with your gun, you know, if you have a squib or you just uh, putting on your gun at the beginning of the match, whatever it might be, you just go to the safe area and you do what you need to do. So point three, and I really think this is the whole foundation of gun safety. You know, if your muzzle ever points at a human being, you go home. No exceptions. And if you don't understand why this is, brother, you are that guy. There is no more important aspect of gun safety than muzzle control. So point number four, uh, beyond the obvious thing that you need to not point your muzzle at a live human being, um, IDPA has some specific technical muzzle rules. If an SO doesn't like where your muzzle's pointing, he'll holler muzzle at you in a very loud voice. But here's the basic concept. There's a 180 degree plane that follows you wherever you are up and down the shooting bay. If your muzzle breaks that plane, you've committed a muzzle violation and you're done for the day. Even excellent shooters can catch a gun on a prop or get a little discombobulated and break the plane. It happens. Just be aware of where it is, especially when moving. It's very easy to get confused in your earliest matches and start to turn around and face up range. If your SO is paying attention, he'll grab you, maybe yell a little, and steer you back on course before you do anything you shouldn't. Don't take it personally if he puts his hands on you. He's helping you. In some cases, you'll also have cones indicating muzzle safe areas. In this case, the muzzle safe zone may supersede the 180 rule so that you can shoot out of a car or something of that nature. But the point remains the same. Keep that muzzle safe. Keep it within the defined safe zone. If the only thing you learn from IDPA is to have a hyper-acute awareness of where your muzzle's pointing, then your participation in IDPA has been worth every minute you spent on it. So, next point. In IDPA, if you're not specifically engaging a target, and engaging is a fancy word for shooting at, then your finger needs to be off the trigger of the gun. Not only should it be off the trigger of the gun, but it should be up on the frame of the gun so that the SO can clearly see that you are not on that trigger. And moreover, if you bump into something, you're not gonna accidentally discharge your gun. 
Again, the SO will yell at you if you don't like where your finger is. Two finger violations in one match and you're subject to disqualification. Same deal with shooting around into the ceiling or over a berm or uh, into a prop that's close to you or when loading and unloading your gun. Okay, so we've talked about rules, but let me dig a little deeper here and talk about general strategies for safety, which is not exactly the same thing as just what the rules are. First, I highly recommend that you not go too fast. Focus on your front sights and making your hits. Moving fast, shooting fast, that should be absolutely the last thing in your mind the first few times that you're shooting IDPA, no matter how good a shooter you are. If you just go slow, your likelihood of doing something that you'll regret is almost nil. So a second point, this is kind of a technical thing, but um, if you've had a lot of training or maybe if you're from the military or police background, you may favor this position here, position Sewell when you're moving or some kind of middle ready type position. That is a great real world way of moving with your firearm, but in competition, it works a little bit differently. You're always in this sort of bowling alley or at least a U-shaped berm. And so keeping that muzzle down range is really, really an important strategy because you're not actually in a 360 degree environment like you would be in a real world kind of situation. When you see uh, high level competitive shooters, they're always going to have that muzzle right up here just like this. As you can see here, if this competitor were using position Sewell, that muzzle would be swinging up range and she'd get disqualified. So, how to avoid these problems? Practice. People tend to think, oh, you know, I should be practicing shooting all of the skills that you think of as being shooting skills, but actually gun handling and the safe handling of guns should be integrated absolutely into your standard practice routine. There's more to it than just pulling that trigger and having something go bang. So another thing, new shooters uh, get way too close to barricades. Uh, even people who are quite experienced often do this. You know, this isn't a rule issue, it's just good practice. Kind of arm's length and a can of beer, that's a good distance to get from a barricade. If you're really smashed up on it, you can get the gun up in your face, uh, you can, you know, have your gun pointed down and shoot your foot or something like that. The more distance you have, the more possibilities for movement and the less likelihood of banging that gun into a prop that you have. Charlie's Angels position, please, no. Also this one, Popeye Doyle sneaking through the abandoned factory chasing down the French connection, no. Skip that one too. Same principle, if you bump something you could shoot yourself in the foot. So this is a point that's really um, you know heartfelt in, in my case. Uh, there have been several members of my family, not close members, but you know, in my extended family, who've been shot, and in no cases were they shot by you know a seven-foot crackhead on a shooting spree at the mini mall. All of these cases happen because of negligence. Guys go into IDPA thinking they're going to learn how to prevail when they get into that OK Corral shootout, which is great, but really. I, I profoundly believe that the most important thing you'll learn in sport shooting is just building safe habits into your gun handling routine. If you have firearms, you should absolutely live Colonel Jeff Cooper's four rules of gun safety. And IDPA will just help you inculcate that kind of thinking about safe operation of firearms into your day-to-day -day life. So next, divisions and classifications. Hey guys, if you found value in this video, I hope you'll consider partnering with the channel to help us bring more videos, better videos, more knives, more techniques, all that cool stuff. Click the link to Patreon to help this channel. Also, if you haven't subscribed yet, bro, what are you waiting on?
and check me out on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all that good stuff. Also, if you're into Japanese swords, check out my website, waltersorrelsblades.com, where you'll see more of my work and where you'll find videos about the making of Japanese swords, along with mounting, fittings, polishing, hamones, all kinds of good stuff. Now, more videos.